I have two books here. I can't find them, but somebody else could. I'm remiss. I stole both books. I didn't really steal them deliberately, but I checked them out in 1986, and I still have them. The net value inscribed in the fly leaves is a total be $16. The reason for the study. Spanish slavery. Do you remember about Cabeza de Vaca? Yep. He lurched around, staggered, and was fed, and passed from tribe to tribe, and he finally encountered some slavers in what is now western Mexico. Slavers? Yes, slavers. Was there slave labor? The missions over at Quarry and other monstrous edifices over there built by the church were intended to toll in the Plains Indians. So they could capture them. And then you got to weave your own basket. Then you got to go to the salt lake and fill it with salt. It only weighed 50 kilos. You got to carry it to Mexico. And when you got there with it, they used the salt in the mineral treatment, but the slave got to work in the mines and life expectancy was 90 days. But the question I have, how did they feed the slaves while they were en route to central and southern Mexico. Well, they actually allowed them to graze on grass. If you didn't graze, you starved to death. So, feeding the slaves was not a serious problem, and if the poor old slave wanted to live, and he was hungry. He'd get out there and strip the grass seeds. That's what they survived on. So this is all oriented toward investigating how the inscribers fed themselves. What are the features? Heavily wooded, lightly wooded, exposed, sequestered, maybe even hidden at times. The, the necessity to obtain provender is with all of us. You can go about nine days ordinarily without food. I'm close to the end of it though. There have been other times when people survived longer, but also a little moisture could be a great help. Now, here in this case, right over the hill here, is what was known by the Spaniards as La Cienega de San Vicente. A Cienega is a sort of a swamp. This was prime horse country for the Apache Indians. And they pretty well 
kept the Spanish away from here. My point is, within a mile, there was a good flowing wet spring. Therefore, maybe there have been or are natural water sources near the depictions. I think that's another worthy point to attempt to determine. Now this will require some caution. Here's an example. Big Spring, Texas was a big old spring. It's as dry as a bone now. Weather affects when we were kids, when Cal and I ran these hills, and we really ran them, we, a 25-mile hike was just a breeze, Boy Scouts. We thought a 50-mile hike was about right. It might take 10 hours, but we could make the 50 miles easily. We ran this country. We knew where every seep was. We might have to take off our shoe and a sock. Put it over a cow track full of water and suck some water through the sock. Why the sock? Because the sock was a better filter than your shirt tail. <laughs> Sorry about that, but anyway, <laughs> these people needed food and water. Let us consider the viability of a study of water sources within reasonable proximity of the depictions. Now we may get in trouble in this respect, I don't think so, but The Anasazi did a pretty good job of depicting petroglyphs themselves. But they didn't chip them into the rock like this is. Obviously indicating tools and tool using. Now, I'm not able to delineate precisely, but I want to make a suggestion here. My son is adept at napping. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Yep. Over on the Mule Creek Road, there are hundreds of acres with the source for napping arrowheads. Now, switch again. The two military officers are up in Zuni country. And an Indian has turned his ankle from horseback so severely that the joints are exposed. And these two Zuni surgeons treated the exposed open joints and they used the sharpest Cutting edge we know. Do you know what I'm referring to? Obsidian. That is correct. Now it is conceivable we want to be open-minded, thorough, and I saw no evidence of it and I watch for it 
I didn't see shards of any stone-like implements at the carvings. But I believed you could make obsidian sharp enough. And I know that you can fasten it to a dot stick with pitch and wrap the joint so the obsidian stays in the handle. Tap, 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 break. Do it again. Maybe they use some other means than metallic tools. Now, once upon a time we were overhauling a tractor. 14 miles northeast of here. And in the transmission there was a little metal detent ball. About a sixteenth of an inch in diameter made of stainless steel. It was not magnetic. And we dropped it. We had to have it. I said, if you just leave me alone, give me some time, I'll find it. So I made a square around the area where the little detent ball was dropped. And I got myself a hundred mesh Tyler screen. Do you know what they are? More or less, they're for gravel analysis and so on, and the different sizes of screens. Anyway, I'm carefully... There it is! We found the little decant ball. Couldn't find it with a magnet. Stainless steel is not magnetic. Some is, most isn't. Point. Maybe observe or what we would call tramp particles. A miner may lose a piece of iron in the open pit mine. Let's say it's a ripper point. Or let's say it's a sledgehammer head from underground. It goes into the ore. That's tramp iron. Tramp particles associated or down or near the depictions that might give a clue. You might even find a broken tool point of metal. Who knows? Now modern metal detecting devices, some of them are pretty sensitive. My son can take, we don't have a bunch of them, wish we did, $20 gold piece and put it on edge in a measured hole 15 inches deep. And his ear is trained to the degree that He can sense that coin on edge, a non-ferrous metal with a metal locator. I think at times a useful tool in investigation. I happen to know this just for an example. Close friend is a head shrinker. He's, he's a professional psychologist. And one of his favorite pursuits is old battle sites and mining camps and stage robberies and so on. Not long ago, near a battle area, namely Cook's Peak, south-southeast by east of here, about 17 miles, airline. 
is a thicket of brambles. And the cattle have invaded the brambles so he can get in there with a metal locator. And he's adept. He can tell you whether all the bullets were coming here or the empty cartridge cases mean they were going that away. So on. So he's in this bramble patch. And he detects a target and he digs it up from a depth of about six inches. And it was a eupolet. You know what a eupolet is? Yeah. A shoulder. Mexican troops didn't have eupolis. They hardly had cotton fabrics to cover themselves with. But Spanish soldiers did. A bramble patch, and I don't think he realizes this, is probably a burial ground. And here's what happens. One time my brother and I are prospecting and we know the history of this old place and we know that the old granddaddy would go out once every six months, come back with one burro load of extremely high grade gold ore. Enough to keep him drunk and all the aunts and nieces and uncles and nephews, hangers on, everybody else fed for six months. So we're there at this old melted down home site. Out in back there's a chip pile. Foot thick. Wood fuel. Look, there's a button. And there's an old piece of fabric and there's a bone fragment. Nobody was ever to follow the old timer and his burro to find out where his high grade was. Hmm. You jump sideways so you'd be convinced. There's a hunting party up in Bear Moore's Cave in Turkey Creek up in the Gila National Wilderness. An old man, Bear Moore, came leading a big old gray draft horse past Bear Moore's cave, named after him. And one of them knew who he was. That's old man Moore. I'm going to follow him. His friend said, oh, we don't advise that. You better not. Well, I'm going to follow him anyway. So he follows him. The old timer turns up Manzanita Creek. The next thing this snooper knew, he was looking down the end of old Bear Moore's blunderbuss. Old Bear Moore telling him, if you try to follow me again, I'll kill you. We dig this deep, and there are burials under the chip. Well, that's why no one followed the old timer. <laughs> I'm going to arrive at a point. He buried his victims at night under the wood chip pile, in the wood pile. Now here comes my point. Ground squirrels dig in the ground. Gophers dig in the ground. Badgers dig in the ground. There are even little burrowing owls. So they bring up soil. Sometimes, as my head shrinker has proven many, many times, the buttons endure. The fabrics don't, but the buttons do. So he knows where there was a slaughter and a burial in the early times. The point being, careful observation of the nearby detritus 
might, even if screening is necessary, depict some clues or demonstrate some clues or provide some clues. So there's all sorts of potential, let's say testing, to attempt to observe indicators that the inscribers left. Maybe they were superbly cautious, I have no idea. At any rate, there's plenty of work that could be applied. I think even gravity sampling, and I'll explain what I mean, could be worthwhile. I think you all know what a gold pan is. Yep. So you put a sample in a gold pan and some water. And it's okay to stir it with your fingers. You should have a bigger gold pan full of water down there. Start tilting the pan. You remember this. Then you wash like that, dipping. But not too much. Get some more water. Around and around again. Stir it up good. Shake it. Wash it from side to side. While you tilt it, let the excess water and light materials wash out. Pretty soon you're going to have a concentrate. If there's anything heavy, and it'll probably be just magnetite, black sand, I won't tell you much, but if there was an artifact of any sort, you might find it that way. So, diligence seems to be indicated but I think many, many indicators can be unearthed with careful applications as of some of the things I've pointed out or indicated from my exposure and I'm going to accuse myself of cogitation. So, there's plenty of work for you kids to do. I've man, there is. You've hot dog a lot of <laughs> thoughts that, man, I've never even considered in a year. Right on. That should be done. You. There, you shut that thing off for a minute. Well, I got some questions for you, too. I got some questions for That's you. That's what you said the first time. Okay. <laughs> I got a few. Do you know Jeez. the prospector that Can first came up here with chest. a sample and asking for anybody who might have seen in it? Do you know that prospector's name? No, I really don't, honey. I, I, got this. I wouldn't even have... A, I, I've thought sincerely and in depth about what ranch dead it would be. Those were tough times. One of the, and I'm just fishing around here, one of the major operations, you can film this if you want, it's not relative particularly, but we had a ranch operation called the Diamond A. And they ranged into Mexico, clear into the Maguillon to the Arizona line, more like on the Rio Grande River. There are no fences. Other grazers were also in the same area. The turkey tracks. They were kind of half tough. They had 35 cowboys. The LCs they were known as. Lions and camels. 
they had lion camps around at different places. You would have a shack, a shed, a little rock hut, something. Maybe a pot or two hanging in there. Probably just a fireplace with a couple of bars from wagon rims or something. Pretty primitive. But I believe, and there's no way to know, that it was probably a Diamond A ranch stead. The, the turkey tracks were more to the northwest, on to the northeast, up about as far as the St. Augustine Plains. You know where that is? No. You know what the VLA is? No, I'm not from around here. It's around Socorro. Okay. Um, well, they have these huge radio telescopes. I mean, they're 180 feet tall, 140 feet across. They move on rail, but there's no grass up there. So the ranch dead wouldn't be over there. Going down here, you know. What? So it was probably. And what decade are we talking about? Well. The first, now I, I want to approach this a little bit carefully. The first really active operation in this neck of the woods was Santa Rita del Cobre. I could talk all night about how they contributed to our freedom today from that little mine. Spaniards, Bernardo de Galvez was up here, right here in this county, in 1767, till Spanish times. Then the Mexicans took over, 1810, 1812, 1820, there was revolution. They ran the Spaniards out and they became Mexicans. Then, President Polk comes along, bless his heart. He wanted the West Coast. He had the advantage of the gold rush. So he sends General Kearney and some of his prime lieutenants out here to capture the West. They were called the Army of the West. And they did it. They fought in California. They fought in Chihuahua. They fought at Brazito. They fought at Monterey. They fought at Chapultepec in Mexico City. They took ship at Veracruz. It was one of the longest military marches from St. Louis to Veracruz that our military ever engaged. And this is 1844, so we're sneaking up on the dates. Silver City I'm gonna back up. We had we had Fort Baird established east of here, eight miles, to protect the mine at Santa Rita, eighteen sixty four. Georgetown Silver mining began in 1864. The Civil War was kind of, you know, wound down. There's a peak over there in the Black Range named McKnight. McKnight Peak. <laughs> McKnight was in prison in Mexico for 12 years. As soon as he got out, no charges. He came right straight to Santa Rita and located the first patented mining claim in the southwest. 
but the Department of Interior turned him down and wouldn't grant his patent because they said there was no mineral discovery and it's been producing vast amounts of copper for 250 years. You couldn't say it wasn't a mineral discovery, but what we're after is dating at this moment. So we had Diamond A Cattle Company and they frequented loading pans at Whitewater and here at Silver City and at Deming and at Hatchita because there was rail. The rail came to New Mexico in 1882. Before that though, the mining camps of the West ate the beef. They didn't drive them to Chicago. That's baloney. They drove them to the mining camps because the miners would eat red meat. So somewhere between 1864 and 1882 is when this discovery at Chloride Flat was made. Now I'm pretty sure that there are writings that delineate the precise date of discovery. Almost the same thing happened at Camp Fleming west of Chloride Flat. Chloride Flat generated Silver City. Camp Fleming was secondary, but the mineral discovery was huge chunks of jet black silver chloride. It's 88 percent silver. An old timer named McMillan drove his milk cow into Silver City and sold milk to the miners. When she dried up he slaughtered her and sold the beef to the miners. And he commented to Mr. Fleming, who Camp Fleming named after Jack Fleming, a gambler. He says, "Why well, I rode past that high grade a many a time. Old man Fleming says, well, in my estimation, anybody that would ride past $80,000 worth of silver right on top of the ground is a damn fool. <laughs> <laughs> so Camp Fleming was a beautiful little camp. They had an actual ice skating rink, had a Chinese laundry, had a deputy sheriff, a neat little town. There's hardly a sign of it left anymore. There was a discovery at Black Hawk in 1882. A factor in all this was that most of the Indians had been subdued by that time. Even Victorio, you know. A group of prospectors went out from where Deming, New Mexico is now, 50 miles south of here, into the Florida Mountains, and they camp on the west side. 4.30 the next morning, one of them goes up on top of the saddle, looks down on them, all he sees is Indians. There's only eight in this party, their names were Frank, Prizer, and his brother, and six other men. They went up there and they built rifle pits quietly, pre-dawn. When the shooting light was good, they start shooting into the Indians and the Indians flee. I would too. The families fled in panic. Who wouldn't? 
the Prizer brothers insisted that they wounded Victorio there. And they probably did. They flee up into the Black Range and cross the Rio Grande and over into Embryo Basin. And they head south for Van Horn Springs. Then they cross into Mexico and advance toward Tres Castillos. But a private Mexican army was waiting for them in ambush. They didn't even send some scouts ahead. Victoria was slaughtered positively there. The Mexicans captured over a hundred women and children, marched them to Mexico City, slaughtered every male that they could find. And my point here is that Indian depredations were lessening, so prospecting was safer. You had less opportunity of being ambushed, and they were the world's best at the arts of the feigned retreat. I mean the Apaches. You chase them up a canyon, and you made a big mistake because they're up here on the sides already. <laughs> now I... Let's see if they have more questions. Well, I want to finish this one statement while I'm on this kick. We have recognized Calvin Sailors. His mother was Sarah Roberts. She was in the Roberts cabin at age four when Victorio mm -hmm. attacked the Roberts cabin. That's well known. That is definitely dated. Captain Cooney was in the area. He said, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to run up the canyon and war, warn a couple other people. So he runs up the canyon and met his death instead. He's buried in a rock up there, what they call Cooney Canyon to this day. But there was much less Indian threat. Therefore, we have a more or less dated period. They shipped all the Indians to Florida. And quite a few of them died off from malaria. Then they shipped them to Alabama and more of them died off from malaria. I have one the Indian threat was gone. Now questions. I have one question about metallurgy. What if I told you that some of the sites were done on live granite and andesite, which were about in Mo 9 hardness? I would want to know the characteristics of the site. How you get it? How about it? You probably can. You, I don't know if you can see. I can't see nothing see right without there. that magnifying glass. And the Here's the different sites and the different places. If you just take your magnifying glass and start flipping through them and looking at them, I can look at them better without it. Okay. Hmm. So you know, you look. See the promontory? Well, I know the site, which is on a promontory. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out. You may be seated. <laughs> <laughs> Who's a school teacher in this family? <laughs> Points are relevant. Water, settlements, accessibility. One thing that hasn't been checked out is metal fragments. Or other don't miss other fragments, so like the obsidian. Well, it's so brittle. I know, but boy, howdy, it can be so sharp, too. So would you handle... I don't think that is the only... Let me talk about this. One time my grandmother and I were walking down from my daddy's gold mine and had a ditch to cross. 
and I looked over there, and there was a big old head of a tomahawk stuck in the soil, not in rocks or anything. At the same time, my grandma said, look at there, brother. That's what she called me. So I dashed ahead and pulled out the big old heavy axe-like tomahawk head. I have found many others. I found one at 3.30 in the afternoon when my grandson was born, so I knew it was a boy. I was out in the hills. I find this beautiful little tomahawk. It's 3.30. Well, Monty was born, and he's a boy. I knew it from the tomahawk. You know, vibes, and being psychic, <laughs> all that hot air and baloney. That's, that's a good this. new one. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think the delicacy of the I'm petroglyphs about, go ahead. Be, do you think the delicacy of the petroglyphs could be handled by stone implements? Well. It almost has to demand sharp points. Would you concur with that? Definitely. Now, I was yammering about tomahawk heads. Yeah. There is a rock type called diorite. Yeah. It is extremely dense, extremely tough, difficult to work. But I've seen axe heads that were fragmented on the cutting edge. No doubt from striking something, the ultimate final blow and the edge suffered. No longer sharp. Broken off. I can't tell you, and I won't attempt to, determine whether or not you could develop a sharp shard from diorite, maybe some other durable rock type that can be separated into, let's say, strands. I, I can't do that for you very well. And we're going to start with pipe stone. You know what pipe stone is? No. Well, pipe stone is easy to work, and they made their bowl with their pipe out of it. Hey, that's a calcium-based stone. It's soft. Yeah, soapstone. Durable. They use soapstone too, but anyway, that's one edge of our part of the scale we're going to go on. And I have two or three things that occur. Well, okay, that's enough of it. You don't need to. There was a seafaring man named Frobisher. He came from the British Isles and he fished the banks up there of northeastern Canada. And his men, the fishermen, they traded with the Inuits or whatever those Athabascans are up there. And they'd bring in these pretty stones, big ones. They told the boss they were diamonds. And he poo pooed the idea, then he threw them overboard. Now, the glacial till cut stria in the rock as the ice moved. So you know the direction of the movement of the ice. Then the ice retreats. The country is populated and people see in the glacial detritus and glacial teal. 
That's a diamond, and it is, and it was. Now, and I knew it, I didn't have any way of being advantaged by it, but I knew where the diamonds were 65 years ago. Everything pointed, and now we have North American diamond production. Now in India, they had a stone 10 feet in diameter. And the guy laid on his stomach and he faceted the diamond. Where did you put them down? I know I'm out in left field a little bit. What if they have diamonds? They are to be watched for, I think. Now, there's an active diamond mine in Colorado. I'm not sure it's still active. It was. A diamond is, a natural diamond generally is pyramidal, recognizable. Now we've gone from a pipe stone that is the softest stone to diamond which is the hardest. Here's the MOHS, Moss Hardness Scale. Calc is number one, you cut it with your fingernail. Copper on up the scale to nine. And the diamond on the same curve is 42. It's not 10, it's 42. It's really hard. There have been diamonds found in the Placer Camp of California. There have been diamonds found in New Mexico, several places. There are diamonds, definite high quality in Arkansas. So somewhere between the soapstone and the diamond must be where we are if they use mineral substance instead of a metal. Now, <clears throat> to, to, to explain or explore the delicacy of the implement seems to indicate to me a metal. Now we're really going to get in some trouble here. But let us assume that there was a braiding of the metallic points, and we concede for the sake of this exercise that they were metallic points. In today's world, we have the electron microscope. And it will show you an atom. It might show you a fragment of a metallic implement. I have no real idea, but this would be soil sampling and observation, maybe not wet chemical analysis. I don't think that would apply very well, but even student operators can see pretty well with an electron microscope. Some of the universities have some. They are an expensive instrument, million dollars. But they're taxpayer supported. They should be accessible to you. And another possibility 
a petrographic microscope, binocular, illuminated, might be a useful implement for examining the detritus below the inscriptions. These seem to be on relatively deep faces. Would you concur with that? Yep. So, you're chipping away and gravity seldom fails. Yeah, I want you to go to the base of triangles. So and you might and start sifting. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be some. Yeah. One of the problems one of the problems we're having with the sites, I like your theory a lot, but a couple of sites are known to have been recarved recently, within the last known 20 years. Known to have been what? Recarved. With steel implants. I would say offhand that that is a serious transgression. But it screws up any it screws up any further analysis. Your your theory not, is not in my right. view. Not in my view. Let's talk about this. Brennan. I can see the problem. Yeah. Do you have any idea what they recarved with? A chisel. A little chisel. Probably chrome vanadium steel. You know, an alloy. Mm -hmm. A determinable mixture of metals. So here's nine places that have been re inscribed. And here's 87 that haven't been. So you find these alloys here, maybe, you know, this is problematical. You find these particles here at the inscribed ones. A careful, serious investigator would take determination could most likely delineate specific minute particles from the instruments they use to rescribe. I think I could do, if I had the horrible law and was 65 years younger, I know damn well I could do it, mm -hmm. given the resources, mm -hmm. understanding gravity, understanding concentration, understanding the composition of proper steel implements, understanding the gradient of the face, where would the fragments be, or right down here, so on. It doesn't seem to me to be inordinately difficult to uh, I grant you it would take dedication, but but the processing is no problem in my view. I'll name them again. Fragments, gravity, alloys, modern steels. I think it would be a... It, you know what we had here in Silver City one time? before there was a jail. Downtown there was a big old oak tree stump. It stood up about 12 feet high and they had some manacles fastened to the tree. And when there was a recalcitrant culprit, they used the lash. And the way they did it in Silver City, they'd give the guy ten lashes. And they'd say, now we want you to come back in two weeks and get your other ten. They seldom came back. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fitting for people who would 
alter an inscription. It is, in yeah. my view, a terrible, terrible transgression of ethics.